flush, we haven't really shown run because it basically flushes every eight hours for five minutes. So if we sat here and wait eight hours, this light will come on and this automatic pass flush comes up. For now, we won't wait eight hours. Pre-treat lockout only applies if you're going to put some pre-treat and put it upstream of the system, which I don't believe you will. So you don't need to worry about that. So the, the alarms of note are these red lamps. These are all critical alarms. And if these alarms occur, the system will stop. The first one is the RO pump water pump. And for some reason, this high pressure pump draws too many amps, currents, and the contactor and the overload inside, as we already discussed, trips this light in order to get, and this pump will stop. In order to restart the system, you will have to, you can see now, because we tricked this, the valve is closing, the lights are off, the system stops. In order to restart the system, you will have to go into the control panel, put the overload back in the run position, hit the reset button, and now the alarm is cleared, and the valve will open, the pump will be stopped. The second alarm is the low-level switch in the bisulfite chemical tank. There's also a similar one for the anti-scaling tank. If these switches indicate that there's no chemical in the tank, the dosing pumps will stop. It will not stop the system, but it will stop the dosing pumps so they don't suck any chemical up, or any air up and without any liquid in the tank. Now I can simulate these by just going over and adjusting the, the switch and making the, uh, the alarm detect But if, if, they, if the level in the tank is too low, the light will come on, pump will stop. Same with the ADC. The light will come on, pump will stop. The last alarm is the low inlet pressure. The switch right here, which is a pressure switch, can be manually adjusted. It will be factory preset to approximately 10 psi, so that if the inlet pressure to the high pressure pump drops below 10 psi inlet pressure, this light will illuminate and the pump will stop to protect the pump from running without any water coming. If you get that alarm, the way to clear that, as well as the other alarm, press the reset button. Light will go out. The system will restart. This alarm is what's called the valve fault. It applies to the flush valve right here and the automatic inlet valve right here. These valves are equipped with limit switches, which indicate the position of the valve, whether it's open or closed. So right now, the valve should be open. If for one, some reason the valve was not open, and the limit switch indicated the valve is not open, this light would illuminate. If we tell the valve to close, if we turn the system off, the valve should close. If the valve closes but doesn't close all the way or doesn't close at all, if the limit switch doesn't indicate that the valve is in the fully closed position, same thing. We get the alarm here and the valve falls. If you do get this fault, you need to go look at the actuator for that valve and the flush valve to make sure that the limit switches are in the right position and uh, everything's operating properly. The last alarm is the IP ORP alarm. As we mentioned before, we have an instrument here to measure online the ORP level of the inlet water. If for some reason this gets too high and you have the bisulfite pump on, the bisulfite pump will run. If, if you don't have the bisulfite pump on or for some reason the bisulfite pump is not doing the job of reducing the ORP, after 30 minutes, this light will come on anyway. We don't want you to run the system for more than 30 minutes with too high of an ORP. To get this alarm, you need to go find out why you have such high ORP level with the chlorine levels too high, there's some other oxidant, maybe the bisulfite is not working right. But you, we do not want you to damage the membrane permanently by exposing them to oxidation for too long a period of time. Now that we've shown you how all the connections are made, electrical and plumbing, Showing you the various valves, and we're showing you the operation of the, the controls and instruments. Now we'll actually show you the actual 
operation of the equipment. So the first thing is we're entering four, we to turn the system on, we got the joking pumps on, in auto, we get the flux in auto, the system is going to start to run. Once the system runs, first thing we want to do is adjust our flow and our, our total flow, concentrate flow, so that we can get the permeate flow and concentrate flow that the system is designed for. This system is designed for to produce about 50 cubic meters per hour of permeate, or in GPM, about 293 GPM, or, excuse me, 220, 230 GPM per permeate with feed of about 293. So the concentrate should be about 70, 73 GPM. So what we're gonna look for here is 52 cubic meters, about 50 tons per hour of permeate and about 15 tons per hour of concentrate. The way we do that is we adjust this throttle valve, which controls the total flow that goes into the membranes. If we close this valve, it reduces the flow of the membranes. We open the valve, it increases the flow of the membranes. Anytime we open this valve and increase the flow of the membranes, chances are we will increase our concentrate flow and increase our, our permanent flow because there's more water going in. But if we need to adjust the, con what the next thing we want to do is adjust the concentrate flow using this concentrate valve here. As we close this valve, that will increase the operating pressure of the system. We reduce the concentrate flow and increase the permeate flow. If we open this valve, we'll reduce the pressure, we'll reduce the concentrate pressure, and as a result, usually increase the concentrate flow, decrease the permeate flow. So we will go back and forth and adjust these valves until we get the flows we want. The focus is on the flows. We get the flows that we want, about 50 cubic meters per hour permeate, about 15 cubic meters per hour of concentrate. When, those, when we have adjusted those valves to get the flows we want, we can look at the pressure gauges here and confirm that we have pressures that make sense. Under normal conditions, we would expect that the pre-filter inlet and outlet pressure will be in the 20 to 40 psi range. Probably higher on the inlet pressure because we'll get some pressure drop across the pre-filter. The pump will discharge in the neighborhood of 150 to 200 psi, depending on the BTDS and the temperature of the water. I would say under normal conditions, the water is about 25 degrees C, the TDS about 500 ppm, the pump discharge pressure and the first array feed pressure will be about 150 psi. Depending on how we control this valve, the more we close that valve, the more we will have a difference between these two gauges. When we're pinching that valve, we might have a higher discharge pressure with a lower feed pressure. The important pressure is the feed pressure to the membrane for this one right here. So we might see this around 200. We should see the feed pressure to the membrane about 150. Then we will get a little bit of a pressure drop between the first array of membranes and the second array of membranes. Maybe this will be 140, 130, if this is 150. And then the concentrate pressure, maybe this is 150, this is 130, this might be about 110, something like that. Maybe 150, 140, 130. And you should see a little bit of pressure drop across those. Then we have the permeate pressure. This system is designed for us to put a little bit of back pressure on the first array membranes so that we can balance the flow between the first array and second array. Under normal conditions, we would expect the permeate back pressure to be 20 to 30 PSI, and the permeate outlet pressure, which is the permeate should be going in your atmospheric storage tank, so this pressure should be very low. The only pressure you should have. The system is equipped with a series of sample valves for measuring the TDS, and other parameters, most likely TDS, but you can measure pH, turbidity, ORP, uh, hardness, iron, any number of uh, parameters you can measure using these sample valves. The idea is that we can this we can test the feed water here. We have the, this first one is the water coming into the pre-filter at the very beginning of the system. Then we have after the pre-filter. The importance here is after the pre-filter. You can measure the turbidity to make sure that the cartridge filter and whatever other pretreatment you have is giving you feed water to the membrane that's less than 1.0 NTU of turbidity. Then the next seven valves correspond to the seven membrane housings. 
the first four are the first array. Vessel one, vessel two, vessel three, vessel four are the first array. And these three are vessel one, two, and three are the second array. These sample values are very important. If for some reason you believe that th there's a problem in your permeate TDS, you look at the TDS meter, you see that the permeate TDS is higher than you think. One of the first things you can do is try to find out if, if it's isolated, the problem with the high TDS is isolated to one pressure vessel or if it's systemic across all pressure vessels. So what you would do is you would check each one of these sample boards for the TDS. Usually we use a handheld meter like this one. We come over here and we open the valve and we check our TDS and we check and compare to the next one, next one, next one. If you have one measurement that's out of range compared to all the others, it might be an indication of you might have an O-ring problem or some other mechanical problem that is allowing the feed water to contaminate the permeate. If all of them are the same, usually it's indicating that there's a membrane problem, either scaling or fouling or some other problem. But these four, first four are array one, next three for array two. The array one, permeate TDS is going to be lower than the array two, always, because the array two is treating the concentrate from array one. The last two are the concentrate out of the system and the final permeate out of the system. So the concentrate leaving the system should be approximately four times the TDS of the feed TDS that you measure over here. The permeate should match, if you measure by hand, should be pretty close to the permit shown on the TDS meter up here. These are very useful in troubleshooting and diagnostics of the system.